All right, well, we'll start here since the sound wasn't working and nobody wants to listen to four minutes of static. <laughs> or I guess it would just be dead silence. I don't know. If it, this is it, now bouncing. All right, sorry. Um, for the record, we already prayed, just so the internet knows. Um, all right, so T of E1 is E2. T of E2 is what? E3. T of E3 is what? Right. So what we have here is E1, T of E1, T of E2. That, let's say, beta 1 is a T-cyclic subbasis. Um, on the subspace of R6, which is spanned by E1, E2, and E3. You see that the um, E3 is, is um, it's already, how can I say this? Um, well, T of E2 goes to E3, right? So this, this is, I mean, this is literally E1, E2, E3, of course, but yeah. Oh, T squared. I, yes, I, I need to do that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I'm glad you caught me there before I got further away from that. Now, right, now it's a T-cyclic basis. Thank you. And then, um, likewise, the, the next four, right, T of E4 is E5, T of E5 is E6, right, and T of E6 is, you know, 3E4 plus 6E5 plus 2E6. So beta 2 is E4, T of E4, T squared of E4, yeah. So that, again, is a T-cyclic subbasis for that. So that, that's going to be generally what the rational canonical form um, corresponds to. Like each block corresponds to some sort of like T-cyclic basis, which is some sort of invariant subspace for the transformation which of course corresponds back to the module language to an invariant sub, you know, to a submodule of, 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 this, of the given module, which here would be R6. I'm assuming it's R. I guess you could make it Q6 or whatever, right? I guess it could be Z6. Uh, no, no, we want a field, we want a field. All right. Um, So, okay, so that's the story over the reals. Would it change over the complexes? Oh, different. Let's take a, take a viewpoint for a second that this was over Q6, right? Q6 module. This is the rational canonical form over the rationals. If we look at the, you know, replace the rationals with the reals, same canonical form. Replace the, you know, extend your field to the complex numbers, same, um, you know, same canonical form. So if we you know, uh, complexify a transformation. Uh, if we extend our field of scalars, the rational, the rational canonical form will not change. In contrast, the, the Jordan form only is defined in Dummett and Foote if the eigenvalues are all in the field, all right? So it could be that a matrix doesn't have a Jordan form, but the complexification of it does, right? Like, for example, I mean, this is the standard go-to example. If we have A equals to, you know, 0 minus 1, 1, 0, then we get the determinant of Xi minus A is X squared plus 1, right? So this is irreducible in R of X, which means that there are no eigenvalues. There are no real eigenvalues for that. But of course, if we think of A as, as, a, as a complex matrix, right? I mean, it is, right? Every real matrix can be viewed as a complex matrix because the reals are a subfield of the complexes. 
Well, then, what happens? Then this, this splits, right? And so we have eigenvalues lambda equals to plus or minus i eigenvalues. All right. Um, so in, in contrast, the Jordan form, it depends on what, I mean, the, expanding your field of scalars could actually bring a Jordan form into existence. Or, or, or I suppose, I think, I'm not sure it can change the Jordan form. Once the Jordan form exists, I'm not sure expanding the field of scalars will, will change anything. You should understand that I'm, I'm forgetting for the moment that we defined the real Jordan form in, in linear algebra. That is a separate, separate animal altogether. All right. The real Jordan form, that's a, a, um, a special event for Math 321, which is, of course, important for applications. But... You'll notice in Dummett and Foot, there's no real Jordan form. There's just rational canonical form and then Jordan form. And the Jordan form is only defined if the eigenvalues for the transformation are all in the field. Yeah. Can you right. Okay. I mean, we're talking about it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, you're not missing anything. So definition. Um, you know, T going from a vector space, let's say finite dimensional. over the field um, has eigenvalues um, as zeros to the characteristic polynomial for t, right? Characteristic of uh, x is equal to the determinant of x minus t, right? If um, if there exist um, dimension of the uh, eigenvalues possibly repeated, um, for T, then T has a Jordan form. And what that means, um, um, e.g., there exists a basis, beta, formed by generalized eigenvectors. Chains, in fact, of generalized eigenvectors. And so let's, let's, let me give some nomenclature here. So like beta 1 as um, uh, I don't know, notation here, guys. Right? So let's say V11. V12, dot, 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 V1K. Well, I, I need to index that. V, dot, 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 dot. K sub 1. Beta 2. V21, V22, dot, 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 dot. V2K, uh, dot, 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 yeah, V2K2. These things I'm writing are chains, which I'll define shortly. Yeah, Morgan? Why is the determinant That's what that means. I'm just being lazy. There's the gory details. <laughs> yeah. But I won't penalize you for writing it if you don't penalize me. So, 
let's see here. And then finally, um, let's say, I don't know, I need some other letter, R. R. I'll use a capital R, so it's more R y. Um, so V, R1, V, R2, da, 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 V, R, K sub R. All right, and um, each one of these comes with an eigenvalue. All right, let's say it comes with, I, this is attached to, this is a lambda one chain. This is a lambda two chain and so forth. This is a lambda R chain. And what that means is that, what does that mean? Well, I'll start with the first one. T, um, T of V11 will be equal to lambda V11 plus V12. Right, and then next, T V one two will be oh, and I meant lambda one, right? Lambda one V one two plus the next one on the list that I haven't written, uh, which would, I guess would be one three, right? And this continues on until you get to the last one. T of V1 K1, which is just defined to be lambda V of 1 K1. So that's where it stops. So let me recast these conditions, what they, what they look like if we rewrite them. We can rewrite these in the language that would have been more familiar for Math 321, all right? Like this first one is just T minus lambda V11 equal to V12. And this is T minus lambda 1 V12 equal to V13. And so forth on down the line until we have T minus lambda 1 V1K1 equal to 0. The language we used in Math 321 was that the last one is an eigenvector, right? Plain old eigenvector with eigenvalue what? Lambda 1 for t, right? And you can prove that like you can prove that t minus lambda 1 to the uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da k1 uh, v11, you can prove that that's equal to 0. And yet, if you look at t minus lambda 1 to the k1 minus 1, it's not equal to 0. In other words, the first thing in the 1 chain is a generalized eigenvector of order k1. So that's what I mean. These are chains of generalized eigenvectors. But they're, okay, they're not t-cyclic, right? But they're almost t-cyclic. You see that? Like beta 1 is what? If I called beta, yeah, beta 1, in the, in the nomenclature of Rotman, it's lengel lengel. <laughs> um, ah, curses. That's not quite it. Well, dang it. I don't know. <sighs> um, 
So like beta one, we could rewrite as it's a you know it's got it's v one one, then it's t minus lambda one of v one one, and in fact, if you work this out, the next one is t minus lambda one squared on v one one until you get to t minus lambda one to the k one minus one on v one one. If you work out the chain, if you if you sort through the chain conditions, you can derive that. I mean, this is by definition v one two, right? But this is in fact v one three, and this you can work out. It's v one k one. Okay, so it's not a T cyclic basis, but it's kind of close, right? It's a T minus lambda times the I, lambda one times the identity cyclic basis for that. And, 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 and by the way, it should be clear from these conditions that what? Well, can you tell me about T of beta one? There's definitely a subset, a subspace of the span of beta one, is it not? In other words, the span of beta one gives you an invariant subspace of the transformation. So that means it's like a submodule. And I, and I should go through this same song and dance for, for the one chain, for the two chain, all the way out to the rth chain. They're all like this, right? But what does that look like? What is the matrix? So if, we, if, if you'll allow me this notation, if we think about T, if we think about T restricted to like the um, W1, right, if we think about T, it's not exactly the restriction, it's, it's, it's a little bit, because I'm chopping down the codomain too, right? But, um, so I'm saying T sub W1, where W1 is equal to what? The span of beta one. We call this K one in, in linear algebra. Yeah. Yes. And I think the notation that I remember using in three twenty one with you guys was K here. I think we use like a capital K one for that maybe. I may not have given it a label. I don't know. But that is the generalized eigenspace for eigenvalue one, or it's part of it anyway. I'd say it's all of it, but I haven't assumed that lambda 1 and lambda 2 are distinct. All right? Um, so with respect to this basis, the matrix of the, the you know, I'm, I'm saying this T sub, w1, T sub W1 is a transformation from W1 to W1. How is, it, how is this action defined? It's just T of X, okay? So what I'm saying is just re restricting T to the W1 subspace and making its codomain also W1, which makes sense because W1 is an invariant, T invariant subspace. With all of that, the matrix of T1 is what's called a Jordan block. In particular, looking at the black conditions I have right there, these guys, we call them star, looking at star, What's star say? Star says that this block looks like lambda one, and then, dang it. Oh, come on. Tell me I haven't done that. Hmm. Kind of hard. <laughs> oh, phooey. Fine. Look what I've done. It's hideous. This is not what I wanted. I want ones on the super diagonal. Dang it. What do I need to do to make that happen? So, 
So, in other words, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. We put the eigenvector first and the generalized eigenvector last. Just turn it around. If you turn the order of the basis beta around, then it makes, I need to, I mean, reordering, we get <clears throat> the same thing but with ones on the super diagonal, okay? Which is what I want because that's what's indomitant foot and that's what's more commonly done. All right? Yes? I need to I need to order them. They need to be ordered this way. So this is no bueno. It should be v1 k1. Put the eigenvector first. Put the next one v1 k1 minus one with my current stupid labeling. <sighs> Son of a gun. Anyway, I should have just copied it down from them and put my bad. I'm sure he has a different labeling, which is less awkward. Listen, it doesn't really matter the labeling. The point is that we can find these T cyclic. I mean, the question is, why can we find these, these, these Jordan chains? Why do they exist? Well, they are in one to one correspondence with elementary divisors. All right, the elementary divisors divisor form of the fundamental theorem of uh, fundamental classification theorem of finitely generated modules over PIDs, if we look at the elementary divisors, we can build from those the Jordan form. So let me try to do that. Oh, oh. it's not a well. I'll shut up. Look, if um, we had a matrix A, all right, and we Smith normal formed that thing, and we got something like 1, 1, x minus 3, and then um, x minus 3 squared um, times x minus 4. Would that make sense? It's a four by four matrix. I've got, if I multiply all the invariant factors out, what do I got? So if this is the Smith normal form, which I hope you guys understand how to calculate. I think I showed you enough of those that you'll be okay with that, right? Um, so this one, we have what? A one of X is X minus three and a two of X is X minus three squared times x minus 4. These are the invariant factors. What are the elementary divisors in this case? Can you guys help me out? X's. It's X, it's okay. It's X minus three, X minus three squared, and then X minus four. The, the, you know, the product of these gives you, of course, the, the product, I mean, the product of the elementary divisors will be the, also equal to the product of the invariant factors. We always, I mean, they always match up in that sense, right? Like they always multiply all together to give the characteristic polynomial. 
for one thing. The, the largest invariant factor is the minimal polynomial. But with these two bits of data, I can tell you what the rational canonical form is for this matrix. So from the invariant factors, oh, I gotta multiply that stupid thing out. Can you guys tell me how with that, what's this multiply out to? I'll do the easy part, x cubed and uh, minus 36. Help me out. <laughs> All right, plus Pac-Man x squared plus ghost x. There we go. So the rational canonical form for this is what? What's the companion matrix for x minus 3? What's the companion matrix for x minus 3? It's a ghost. Come on. What do you say? Um, we know minus x is Okay. Well, the companion matrix, the companion matrix for x minus three is just three. So that gives you a three. What's the companion matrix for the other one? Well, it's zero, one, zero. 0, 0, 1. Um, and then uh, what we do? 36. It's the constant one first, right? 36. And then minus 33. And then 10. That's the rational canonical form if that's what the Smith normal form reduces to, okay? What's the Jordan form for this matrix? Well, the Jordan form, we put a Jordan block for each elementary divisor. The Jordan block for x minus 3 is just 3. The Jordan block for x minus 3 squared, after I get my basis in order, is 3, 1, 0, 3. One's on the super diagonal. And then there's also a 1 by 1 Jordan block for 4. Let me, let me, I think best for us to try to look at more examples, right? Um, what if we had a matrix A which Smith normal formed to, and I mean, what's the Smith, the Smith normal form is what? It's, it's Xi minus A, and then we do row and column operations. Eventually we get to something, right? Um, let's see here. Let's, I'm trying to make it, uh, um, x minus 1 cubed, um, x minus 2 squared, and then we'll do x minus 2 and um, x minus 1 squared. And then up here we'll have an x minus 1. I don't know, how many 1s should I have? Five, six, eight, nine. I guess there's six ones up there. I mean, it's got to be a nine by nine matrix to have that many factors, right? If the characteristic polynomial is nine ninth order, that means that it's a nine by nine matrix that we're reducing. So there has to be there have to be there would have to be six ones up there by process of counting. You know, five, six, eight, nine. That's the ninth order if I multiply them. All right, invariant factors. 
So I have a1 is x minus 1. I'm, a2 is x minus 1 squared times x minus 2. A3, which is, of course, the minimal polynomial, um, x minus 1 cubed times x minus 2 squared. So if I call these, um, so like the rational canonical form looks like 1. I'm going to call this thing f of x, okay? <laughs> the companion matrix of f of x. And I'm, I don't feel like multiplying this out. g of x, okay? The companion matrix of g of x. Right? I mean, f of x is a what? It's a 3 by 3, right? g of x is a what? 5 by 5. That, that the rational canonical form would look like that. Any matrix, any 9 by 9 matrix which was similar to, to, to A, right? Any, matri any 9 by 9 matrix which is similar to A would have also the same rational canonical form. And any 9 by 9 matrix, any 9 by 9 matrix which was similar to A would also have, up to reordering of the blocks, the same Jordan form. What's the Jordan form here? Well, the question is, what are the elementary divisors? The elementary divisors are what? Well, it is x minus 1, x minus 1 squared, x minus 2, x minus 1 cubed, x minus 2 squared. <laughs> you just list them out. Going from invariant factors to elementary divisors is not, not hard. It's the other way around that's tricky, right? It's trickier to go from elementary divisors to invariant factors because there you have to have the divisibility, you know? But with that, the Jordan form would be like this. One for that one. And then one, 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 zero for the second one. That next thing in the list, I'm just doing it in the order of I've listed. I'm, I'm doing the Jordan blocks in the order I've listed the elementary divisors. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the elementary divisors and the corresponding Jordan blocks for the matrix that represents this linear transformation. That's, that's the way it works. This gives me a three by three Jordan block. That looks like one, 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 zero. So ones, there's always ones on the super diagonal, and the eigenvalues go down the diagonal. So that's for this one. And then finally, um, 2, 2, 1, 0. And that would be the Jordan. Now, the Jordan form is not unique. There's an ambiguity in the Jordan form, because I listed the elementary divisors like that, right? If you listed them in a different order and went through my algorithm, you get a different Jordan form, right? Jordan form is only unique up to a reordering of the blocks. Okay? But if two matrices have the same Jordan form up to a reordering of the blocks, then they're also similar. This is one of the uses. Now, if you understand the game we're playing, if I give you the Jordan form of a matrix, you can also write down what? You can write down its invariant factors and its elementary divisors. Let's see if we can do that. None of these things really help you much with that homework problem I have about calculating the, uh, the Jordan form for the second derivative, second derivative operator. Or I have like the, calculate the Jordan form for the second derivative in the homework. That one you should attack in the sense of linear algebra, I would think. Like you just want to solve the chain conditions. You want to actually look for generalized eigenvectors and eigenvectors and like piece the chain basis together if you do that, then you'll find the Jordan form for the second derivative operator. Um, I think the t-cyclic basis for that problem are something like 1 and then x squared 
because if you if you two, if you do double di double differentiate x squared, it brings you back to one, right? And then x cubed, if you twice differentiate, it brings you back to x. So like one and x squared are one t cyclic subbasis, and x and x cubed are another. They're not t cyclic, right? They're um, well, are they? I don't remember. I'm sorry, but it's like that. I'll shut up. Example. How about we have a three, a three, a three, a one, a one, a zero, a zero, a zero, a zero. And then I put a three, a three, a one, a zero, a four, and then a four and a four and a one. I'll throw a five in. Why not? There are one by one five block down there on its lonesome. So we're looking at a what by what matrix. Uh, it seems to be like nine by nine examples at the moment. Okay, so my question to you is, what, is, what are the elementary divisors? Let's start with the simplest thing. Elementary divisors for A or what? So this is coming from an elementary divisor of x minus 3 cubed. This is coming from an elementary divisor of x minus 3 squared. That gives me an x minus 4. This gives me an x minus 4 squared. And this gives me an x minus 5. You can actually figure out the minimal polynomial and kind of proceed from there to find out invariant factors. Yeah, we could look at, I mean, Dalmatian Foot gives a specific algorithm for finding the invariant factors. I'm way past the point of being able to recite that decently. But I can explain to you how to find the minimal polynomial. It's pretty simple. You need to basically pick on the biggest block. So. I, I need like an x minus minimal polynomial. I need an x minus 3 cubed because x minus 3 times the identity, it makes this be like a 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. And it makes this be a 0, 1, 0, 0. And I don't care what happens down here. But these, when I, when I cube it, these go to 0 if I look at x minus 3 cubed. On the other hand, down here, if I put an x minus 4, I need x minus 4 squared in order to zero these out and leave me with a nilpotent matrix of order 2 on the block. So that when I square it, this will square to 0. That takes care of the 4s. And then the 5, well, 5 is just an x minus 5. So if you look at that and you actually compute, if you think about how block matrix multiplication works, it's clear that the a minus 3 times the identity or a minus 4 times identity, or a, a minus 5 times identity, appropriately cubed or squared, multiplied together, gives you zeros. But you have to pick the biggest, the biggest block of a given type in order to take care of that. But that's the minimum. Once you know the minimal polynomial, then you can kind of work your way down what, what's next. What's, so that, that, that's my A. Uh, did I call that A? We call that A1, or we call that, I forget the num AM, right? I'm not sure how many there are, so I guess I have to call it AMX at the moment. Hey, you be quiet. I said, shush, shush. All right. <laughs> My brother has sent me a meme about choosing the uh, governor of Virginia that's based on Michael Jackson, and it's, it's hilarious. I'll tell you after class. Um, what's left? That's six. We get, we've taken care of six. There's three things left, right? So I think what we need next is the x minus 3 squared. 
and the oh the x minus four, right? That's all that's left over. So apparently that was a two of x, and this is a one of x. The rational canonical form is what? It's got two blocks. The companion matrix of a one of x and then the companion matrix of a two of x. That's the rational canonical form. It's just got these two big stupid blocks. One is uh, six by six, the other one is three by three. But there exist, there exist t-cyclic bases. I mean, well, yep. It comes from the fact that A1 has to divide A2. Right, but like if it was just x minus 4, A1 would still divide A2. Right, but then what do I do with my x minus 3? Because then it would have to divide x minus 4 in the next step. Then what if it's it's like, one chess. Factor of it's like chess. It's like chess, y'all. What's that? What if it's one factor of x minus 3 times x minus 4? You'd still be in trouble because you'd have to, you couldn't, you couldn't put, you couldn't put like x minus 3 divides x minus 4 divides a2 of x. Like, you couldn't do that, right? I mean, that's the trouble. Right. Like, saying that a1 of x was x minus 3 times x minus 4, and say, like, something else was just x minus 3, because x minus 3 would still divide that, and that would still divide the other one. Yes. If I, instead of having this, if I had, like, this, if I had like that, then I could have this, and then this would be three, this would be two, and then this. Poor planning, and, poor planning on my part that we always just have two invariant factors in my examples. You could have three, or four, or five. But the larger point, I'm hoping you, I hope I showed you enough that you can see how to go from the Smith normal form for the matrix and either to the, either to the Jordan blocks or to the rational canonical form. I am hoping that's starting to become clear. Be sure to look at the first two examples in Dummett and Foote where he uses the interplay between the characteristic and minimal polynomial to figure out things about the matrix. There's like some really simple thinking there that makes good questions. I'm trying to tell you where it is a second here. That thing go. Schnikes. They're not comp they're not heavily computational examples. I think they're I think they're like examples one and two in the rational canonical form. Yeah, on page 482 to 483, he looks at matrices A, B, and C and tries to decide whether or not they're similar. 482 and 483 examples, like I think example one and two, he looks at three, three by three matrices A, B, and C and he studies whether or not they're similar by examining what their characteristic polynomials versus what their minimal polynomials are. So you can easily determine what the rational canonical form is for those just because of the divisibility relations between the, the minimal and the and the minimal and the characteristic polynomial. If it's a three by three, you don't actually have to go to the, the full machinery of the Jordan, uh, the Smith normal form. You can actually kind of piece, you can figure it out piecemeal. So like do make sure you read example, that, that example one, um, an example, I think example two. Well, example two has more, but I, especially example one, I think, has the simple thinking I'm trying to, I haven't done in class, but I really should, because that's like the easiest possible kind of problem to ask about these things, I think. But anyway, obviously you guys only have an hour in class test, right? So I'll try to not get too carried away, but if you understand what I did here, you see there's some relatively simple questions that I can ask that don't require a stupid amount of calculation. They just require some kind of like pattern matching, more or less. Yeah. I shut up. I did start.